Hey Sam, did you get a chance to go through chapter 3 on hazards? Yeah, I did. It's a bit overwhelming how many hazards there are to watch out for, but understanding them is crucial for our safety on the river. Definitely. Let's go over each one to make sure we have a good grasp. Starting with overhanging branches, what do we need to know? Overhanging branches are usually found on the outside of bends where the current pushes you towards the bank. They're easy to avoid, but novices often get fixated on them. If we can't avoid thin branches, we should lean forward, make ourselves small, and let the current push us through. Holding onto them can capsize us or pull rafters into the water. Exactly. And for strainers, they're even more dangerous. A strainer is any obstruction that allows water to pass but not boats or swimmers, like tree branches or fences. We should always paddle away from them. If we get swept into one, the best bet is to try to climb over it rather than being pulled under. I read that open boaters have a slight advantage here since it's easier to get out of the boat. Avoidance is definitely key with strainers. And what about boulder sieves? They sound terrifying. They really are. Boulder sieves are like extreme strainers where the water flows through gaps in a mass of boulders. The only real solution here is to avoid them completely. There's no safe way to navigate through a boulder sieve. Agreed. Brooches are another big concern. What's the best way to handle them? Brooches happen when we're swept sideways onto an obstacle. In gentle waters, it's not too problematic, but in powerful currents, it can seriously damage the boat or trap the boater. If a brooch is inevitable, kayakers should lift the upstream edge and lean onto the obstacle to let water pass under the boat. If caught and unable to escape, it's best to get out quickly. For open boaters, throwing their weight towards the obstacle and onto the downstream side of the boat can help, but they need to be ready to bail out if necessary. Raft guides should try to hit obstacles with the bow or stern and call for a hold on slash hold on, get down command to brace the crew. Good points. Vertical pins are also really dangerous. What should we watch for? Vertical pins happen when the bow gets lodged over a drop with obstacles or shallow water at the base. If a vertical pin is possible, we shouldn't run the drop unless we're confident in our technique to buff the drop and keep the bow up. Having team members ready to assist is crucial in case of an error. Undercuts sound equally risky. What's the main danger there? Undercuts occur where the current flows under an overhanging obstacle, like an eroded bank or boulder. If swept under, we'll almost certainly capsize. The real danger is hidden strainers or narrowing undercuts that can trap a paddler. Avoidance is crucial. We should look for cushion waves. Their absence often indicates an undercut. And sometimes, if the river is being run in lower water levels, the overhanging rock makes it obvious that it's undercut underneath. Right, undercuts are sneaky. How do we identify siphons? Siphons are tunnels where water flows through gaps in bedrock or boulders. They're hard to spot, but if there seems to be less water coming out of a pool than going in, suspect a siphon. Sometimes a vortex effect can indicate one. Inspecting the riverbed during drought conditions helps spot siphons. And if you see water entering a pool but can't find a corresponding exit, it's a red flag. Yes, siphons can be deadly. Let's talk about dangerous stoppers. Dangerous stoppers, or hydraulics, can hold a swimmer. They may have weaknesses indicated by a tongue of water flowing through, which can be used to escape. Assessing the stopper involves looking at whether it's deep or surface, even or uneven. If in doubt, we should portage around it. And double recirculation stoppers are particularly lethal. We should look for signs of erosion at the base of the rock or recirculating water behind a waterfall. Any vertical drop with decent flow should be considered suspect. Excellent, Liz. Understanding these hazards and how to handle them is vital. Let's make sure we keep these points in mind on our next trip and always be ready to portage if we're unsure. Absolutely. Safety first, always. And you know, it's important to keep practicing our rescue techniques too. Being prepared can make all the difference if we encounter any of these hazards. Agreed. Thanks for going through this with me. I feel much more prepared now. By the way, have you ever heard of low head dams? 
I was reading about how dangerous they can be. Yeah, I know a bit about them. They're also called weirs, right? They can create pretty hazardous conditions for swimmers and boaters because of the way they trap water. Exactly. The problem is that they're symmetrical and produce these regular stoppers with no weaknesses. The water gets recirculated without any break, making it hard to escape if you get caught. That sounds terrifying. I remember reading that horseshoe-shaped low-head dams are especially dangerous because they pull you right back to the middle of the river. Right. And then there are anti-scour low-head dams which have this lip that prevents erosion but creates a really strong recirculating flow. It's almost impossible to swim out of that. So scary. Are there any ways to reduce the risk if you're near one of these dams? Some measures include putting steel stakes, concrete, dragon's teeth, and gabions on the riverbed. But even these can be dangerous when they start to erode or break down. I've seen those gabions before. They can become hazardous if the wire mesh gets damaged. It's good to know that some low-head dams are built with intentional weaknesses, though broken ones can still be risky because of exposed steel rods. Fish passes are also something to be cautious around. They can trap you, and it's often illegal to paddle near them anyway. Excellent. Sum. Understanding these concepts is crucial for staying safe on the river. Keep studying and practicing, and you'll become a proficient whitewater paddler. Absolutely. And don't forget to listen for the noise of water overflowing. Even if some stoppers are quiet, the noise can be a big giveaway. It's pretty clear that the best practice is to portage if there's any doubt. Asking locals and inspecting the dam and stoppers can save lives. Definitely. It's not just the dams, though. Other paddlers can be a hazard too, especially in crowded play holes. Following playboating etiquette is important to keep everyone safe. For sure. It's all about communication and respecting each other's space on the water. Have you read anything about the environmental hazards, like sudden immersion or hypothermia? Yes, sudden immersion in cold water can be really dangerous. Wearing the right gear like foam-lined helmets or neoprene skullcaps helps a lot and hypothermia can sneak up on you, affecting your judgment even in its early stages. The symptoms of hypothermia are pretty severe. Continuous shivering, slurred speech, and even violent outbursts are signs that things are getting serious. Treatment focuses on preventing further heat loss and slowly reheating the victim. Creating a warm, moist environment helps rewarm them from the inside. And in serious cases, seeking hospital treatment is crucial. Also, rubbing the victims or using warm objects on them is a big no-no because it can actually cool the core further. That's right. We also need to watch out for hyperthermia in hot climates. Staying hydrated, wearing appropriate clothing, and taking breaks in the shade are key preventive measures. Heat exhaustion can progress to heat stroke if not treated. So, it's important to recognize the symptoms early and get to a cool area immediately. Yeah, and treating sunburn and dehydration is just as important. Drinking water frequently and using sunblock can prevent these issues. This conversation has been really informative, Sam. It's always good to refresh our knowledge on these topics to stay safe on the water. Agreed, Liz. Staying aware and prepared can make all the difference when dealing with the hazards of paddling. Let's go over some more details to make sure we have everything covered. Good idea. We talked about the different types of low head dams. Horseshoe dams recirculate victims to the center and anti-scoured dams create powerful recirculating flows. But what about identifying them? Sure. One of the first signs is calm, deep water upstream of the dam because low head dams hold water back, forming a pool. You should also listen for the noise of water overflowing. Sometimes it can be quiet, but it's often noticeable. Right, and visually, you can look for an event horizon. The dam creates a sudden drop, so you'll see a foreground, a false horizon, and a background. This missing middle ground gives you a valuable early warning sign. Plus, changes in the height of the river banks can indicate a low head dam. Concrete constructions or old mill buildings are other visual clues. During the Industrial Revolution, many low head dams were built to power mills. And don't forget the warning notices. In parts of Europe, these are common, especially where canoeists are seen as valuable tourists. Even if you can't read the language, symbols like skull and crossbones are pretty clear. True, but we should never get complacent. 
The absence of a warning sign doesn't mean the dam is safe. Always inspect and ask locals if you're unsure. Moving on to other paddlers, there's a play boating etiquette we need to follow. Keep out of the gate line on slalom sites and give way to boaters descending the river. It's courteous to signal them to come down if you're in a play hole. Yeah, and if someone is hogging the hole, it's best to have a word with them in the eddy rather than trying to force them out. Safety is more important than hogging a spot. Exactly. Environmental hazards like sudden immersion in cold water can stop a paddler from thinking clearly. Wearing suitable gear can help prevent this. Cold water can cause hyperventilation too. Some guides suggest shouting loudly when surfacing to expel air and attract attention. Hypothermia is another big risk, especially in cold conditions. Even mild hypothermia can affect judgment. It's important to recognize symptoms like shivering, lethargy, and unusual behavior. Prevention includes careful scouting, fitness, proper clothing, and looking out for each other. And if hypothermia sets in, prevent further heat loss and reheat the victim slowly. Use group shelters to create a warm environment and give them high-energy foods. For serious hypothermia, seek hospital treatment and evacuate the victim on a stretcher if necessary. Avoid rubbing them or using warm objects on their body because it can worsen their condition. In hotter climates, hyperthermia is the concern. Drink plenty of water, avoid putting on a wetsuit too early, and take breaks in the shade. Be aware of signs like headaches, dizziness, and confusion. If someone shows signs of heat exhaustion, move them to a cool area and give fluids. For heat stroke, reduce their temperature, fan them, and seek urgent medical attention. Finally, sunburn and dehydration are also risks. Wear long-sleeved garments, sun hats, and use waterproof sunblock. Drink frequently, even if it's inconvenient. This detailed review has been great, Sam. Staying informed and prepared is key to enjoying paddling safely.